pre-recorded from Joe's mom's basement. Welcome to another Wednesday Rewind episode of the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern, or like my speedwalking coach calls me, the Fintern. Well, bad news. I might not make it to the Olympics this year for speedwalking. Apparently taking three walks around the block isn't, quote, enough work to qualify. But even though I won't be there, I told the guys we should all have our own pre-Olympic coverage, and they agreed. It turns out that we can all learn about money from someone who's achieved some pretty big goals. Today, we'll take a look at this episode from a few years ago when Joe interviews real Olympic athlete and certified financial planner, Lauren Williams. She's an Olympic silver medalist bobsledder, Olympic sprinter, and now a podcaster and Dallas-based financial planner. She really can do it all, and she and Joe talk about ways to win with your money. But I don't want to ruin the whole episode for you, so take a listen yourself. This show originally aired in 2018, so make sure to ignore any giveaways or mentions of current events at the time. Enjoy Finturn Out. The world record is in jeopardy as Hyden turns down off the last turn. The world record 1434-33. Hyden moving powerfully for the finish line, and he snaps the time beam at 1428-13. A new world at Olympic record for Eric. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and hey there, Winter Olympic fans. Imagine this. Most people don't know about my past life as a bobsledding champ. I'll take you down that memory lane in just a minute. But today, we welcome Olympic silver medalist in the two women bobsleigh, as they call it, and host of the Worth Listening podcast, Lauren Williams. We also do what we always do here on the show, like throw out the Haven Lifeline, joke about OG's bad hair, or like what hair, and we're going to deliver some mind-bending trivia like a ninja. And now, two guys who couldn't even win the snow cone eating contest back in middle school, Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. That's because I just got brain freeze. Oh, gosh, isn't that the worst thing? It's horrible. My wife doesn't get it, and one of my kids don't get it. They don't get brain freeze. Show-offs. I know. Lording it over you like that. That's horrible. Like, look at me eat this Slurpee. <laughs> oh, in one sitting. <laughs> Get part way through. You ever hear the Eddie Murphy bit about brain freeze? No, but one of my kids asked what it was like, and my other kid said, it's like if somebody stabbed you in the roof of your mouth with a knife and it poked you in the eyeball. You're... I'm like, that is exactly right. <laughs> You're correct. Here's your gold star. Your kids are surprisingly succinct at explaining stuff like that. And accurate. Yeah. It's amazing. This episode is brought to you by Simply by Frito-Lay. These days, you have a lot going on. But now, thanks to Simply by Frito-Lay, you have one less thing to worry about. So kick back and enjoy your favorite Frito-Lay snacks with ingredients to feel good about, like Simply Blue Corn Tostitos, Sea Salted Ruffles, and even White Cheddar Cheetos Puffs, all made with no artificial colors or flavors. Enjoy what you love and look for Simply Brand snacks online or at a store near you. Enjoy a powerful business upgrade with Dell Technologies Black Friday in July event. Get amazing savings with up to 50% off high-performance computers and tech built for business and be able to take your office with you with Windows 10 Pro. Plus, get great offers on Dell servers, monitors, docks, and more, all with easy financing options through Dell Financial Services. Call 877-ASK-DELL. That's 877-ASK-DELL. And speak to a Dell Technologies advisor today. We are magnifying this thing. We've got Lauren Williams, who won the silver medal for the U.S. bobsled four years ago. And right now, we got your headlines, so let's move. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Oh, boy. This is a fun one, OG. First headline comes to us from the Money Ish blog. I love this blog just because it's so quirky. It's so all over the place. Alyssa Wolfson wrote this piece. Why Nicolas Cage blowing more than $100 million is an essential money lesson for us all. You know what the essential money lesson is? I can get it right from the headline. 
Don't blow a hundred million dollars. Make a hundred million and keep some of it. Only spend fifty million of it. Right. Yeah. Alyssa Wolfson writes: Nicholas Cage's high flying lifestyles led to a financial crash landing. The Oscar winning Cage fifty four has reportedly blown through much of his hundred and fifty million dollar fortune, according yeah. to a recent special shown on CNBC's The Filthy Rich Guide, which chronicles the spending excesses of some of the world's wealthiest. Cage's extravagant purchases include, get this. 15 residences, a Newport Beach, California waterfront home for $25 million, and two European castles worth a collective $12.3 million were among them, as well as a deserted island in the Bahamas for $3 million, other seemingly ill-advised buys, a collection of shrunken pygmy heads. Who doesn't have, who doesn't have that collection, by the way? Duh. Need uh, that. A Lamborghini owned by the late Shah of Iran for $450,000, a pet octopus for $150,000, and a 7 million year old dinosaur skull for $276,000. So it sounds like some of these things you could probably you could probably liquidate a few of them. I mean, I don't know. There's there's a lot of takers for a really old Lamborghini, but uh, you might be able to offload that castle and certainly the... Not a lot of takers. Certainly the... Uh... Not a lot of takers for an old Lamborghini. Who who wants a classic sports I mean, car? It's like a, yeah, but it's, you know, when you look on Carfax, right? Third owner. It's like, eh. Oh, you know. of that Lambo. What? Well, it's probably got like 180,000 miles on it, too. You know? It smells like smoke or something. Right, because you take it on road trips between here and Indiana. You might. When I don't you, know. When you I've go never for... had a Lambo. I don't... I'm, I'll let you know. I don't... That's what we should do. We should buy one, you know, for research purposes. Yes. And I will uh, tell you the best way to uh, abuse the heck out of it. Um, Forget going to the Stacky Benjamins experience. If you really want to be one with the show, just send OG a Lamborghini. That would be fantastic. The Newport Beach House, that's got some legs. I'm sure he can probably get rid of that. Says Cage's over-the-top lifestyle is a lesson for us all. Quote, it's so easy to overspend on little things that don't matter. And little stuff will keep you from affording the big stuff that's really enjoyable, says financial planner David Ray. I think that is the big lesson. I was thinking about this the other day. I was talking to somebody. I can't remember. And one of my things, uh, kind of downtime things that I'll do is I'll open Zillow and I start looking at like lake houses and stuff. Not that I'm going to buy one because they're gazillions of dollars, but they're kind of, you know, it's just kind of neat to see those those big homes. And I always think like, OK, if I was going to buy a three million dollar vacation house, you know, on the lake or in the mountains or something like that. Right. You start thinking about the math on that and you go, okay, well, I got to put a million down, right? Like 30%. And then my payment's going to be 20 grand a month, maybe something like that. I don't know. I, I mean, how many, how many vacations can you go on with a million? Like if you go, this is, we can do one of two things, sweetheart. We can buy a debt, <laughs> right? Buy a house payment with a million bucks or, we can put this in an account and this can be our vacation budget. Gosh, darn, that's a lot of vacationing, right? That is. But at this point in the game, I mean, do you really do you really care? I was reading about Tony Robbins houses and, and he's got some houses in the uh, Canadian Rockies. One house in particular he was talking about that he reportedly goes to once a year. You know, that's what I'm talking about. You know. Fine. You, you've got the home that you live in, right? And yeah. I can even understand yeah, people it. that go, yeah, but I spent half my time in New York and half my time in L.A. Okay, fine. You got two homes. Sure. But do you need the lake house in Georgia and the ski chalet in the Swiss Alps and the beachfront home in the Bahamas? And, you know, couldn't you just take the money that you would spend on that and go, this is going to be what we're going to use to go to those places? I mean, my gosh, you can stay at a freaking Ritz Carlton or something. Almost as nice? I don't know. Luckily, avoiding overspending on non-essentials isn't as hard as it sounds, as Peace says. Set a dollar limit for impulse purchases, maybe 50 or 100 bucks. Weak. <laughs> and if you're, come, step up to the plate. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if you're going to impulse spend, spend. And if your you coveted know. purchase meets or exceeds it, wait 24 hours before buying it to determine if it's a need or just a spontaneous desire, says Ray. You should also set a monthly limit on total non-essential purchases by looking at what you can afford to spend after you both pay for basics like rent and food and put away money for savings. You can even do this more easily, OG. You can do what Paula Pant does, which is, number one, put away the amount that you've targeted for saving. Number two, pay for the essentials. Number three, forget the budget, just spend the rest, and when it's gone, it's gone. 
Yeah, I mean that's not a bad way to do it, no, right? It I mean, really if if you've got if you've got all of your savings goals accomplished and you've paid you know the bills that you have to pay, and especially if you're in a position that has variable income, right? We get a lot of questions about that, like how do I budget that stuff? Well, you've got the base amount that you need. It's not a bad way to do that, is it? Not at all. Yeah, I mean, once you've got the uh, savings goal accomplished and and you're spending money on the stuff that you need to spend, you know, who cares if you spend the rest? Doesn't matter. I'll link to this because they go over several other people, such as Johnny Depp, 50 Cent, who we've talked about recently, Rihanna, Lindsay Lohan, Heidi Montag, uh, Kanye West, Tony Braxton. Uh, pretty exciting stuff and pretty sad, actually, when you think about it. The takeaway from Nicolas Cage is that if you've got $100 million, OG, maybe you try to save what? 30 of it just just try to limit it to spend in 70 you I might know, be okay if you can try to i mean it's not a it's not a retirement sum but it, it's a small start 70 million <laughs> lauren williams is the host of the worth listening podcast where she discusses meaningful money memoirs of millennials and professional athletes. She herself, <laughs> big time athlete OG, not only is she the gold medalist in the 100 meter dash at the 2005 World Championships and won the silver medal at the 2004 Summer Olympics, 2007 World Champions and the 2006 World Indoor Championships. She also, corresponding with tomorrow's opening ceremonies, in Korea, she won the silver medal in the two women bobsled at uh, the 2014 Winter Olympics. Uh, she's been a world junior champion 2002, won the 100 meter dash in the 2003 Pan American Games, and claimed the NCAA title over the distance for the University of Miami the following year. We're so happy she's here talking finances, financial planning, and what it's like to be an Olympian in the Winter Olympics. Let's say hello to Lauren Williams. How are you? I am doing wonderful. Excited about the opening ceremonies. I know. So do this for me. You're the only person I know, frankly, who's been through this and only the second Olympian we've had on the show. Tomorrow night, from your point of view, walk me through what it's like waiting and then walking out during the ceremony. It's really amazing, especially for the Winter Olympics, because it's a much more intimate environment. You get to walk underneath the stadium, talk to all the athletes for a short little period, and you watch the actual opening ceremony. How much earlier are you there before the ceremony starts? Are you waiting back there like two hours, three hours, or are you there 10 minutes, 15 minutes, what? It depends on logistics. So some athlete villages are walking distance from where the opening ceremonies will be and others are far, far away. And you have to arrive up to 12 hours in advance to kind of work through all the logistics. So summer, a lot more goes into it, whereas winter, it's a lot more intimate, not a lot easier process, a lot fewer athletes. And like I said, we get to watch the opening ceremonies. It sounds like you're saying that uh, that the Winter Olympics for you, from an athlete's point of view, is more fun. The opening ceremonies aspect, definitely more fun. I think a lot of people watch on television and say, oh my goodness, it's so amazing. Was it so amazing? There is this amazing moment when you walk into the stadium and everyone's cheering and you realize this is your moment and that you're here and you're going to compete soon, no matter which games you're in. But for winter, being able to sit and participate and see the show, then you can come home and say, yeah, it was amazing. We're going to get into this later about being initially a track athlete and transitioning over to the bobsled because that has a lot to do with financial planning. You've put it into a blog post that we'll link to on our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. But I'm sure when you're not thinking at all about TV cameras or anything when you're up on the top of that mountain getting ready for the bobsled, what's going on in your head when you're standing up there for the two women bobsled getting ready to go? Someone else is counting on me. Have I done everything I can possibly do to prepare for this? Yes. And even if you haven't, you better tell yourself, yes, you're at the Olympics, <laughs> dagnabbit. <laughs> so really just not letting my partner down in that moment is the thing, is, is channeling my energy so that I can do a good job for myself, but more so for her. I love that, that your energy is on somebody else. I mean, that to me, it builds pressure, but it also takes some pressure off that it's not about me. It's about the team. Yeah, it's really cool to not have to think about yourself. You know, 
sometimes you get so inwardly focused that you get off track and being able to think of someone else and what this moment will mean to them is a really important part of the process. And then running on ice versus running on a track. How is that different? Do you have spikes on or, or some type of big metal cleats, I think? Yes, they're like little needles, actually. Track spikes are like bigger. They kind of look pyramid-ish, whereas these are like little needles like you will bleed if you spike yeah. yourself with the, the ice spikes. But it's not so different. You seem like you have to get over the initials being scared of running on ice, but once you get on the ice, you get good grip with the shoes that we have. But you see on these these shows about the Olympics, like, you know, the Germans are being mean, the, the, the different countries are all cutthroat. Is it really like that or are you just kind of focused on you? You are definitely just focused on you, the task that you're there to complete. And like I said, keeping positive energy around your team. One of the cool things about the games is really being able to socialize with people from all over the world and learn about different cultures, et cetera. But the drama is something yeah, that has to be played up for TV. They got to find one thing and then they got to blow it out of proportion. Right, of course. We're not experiencing that. <laughs> all right. So you're running, you're running, you're running. You're throwing yourself into the back of the bobsled, bobsleigh, whatever they want to call it. And on TV, I see you put your head down. Tell me the feeling going down the hill. Initially, the first time you ever get in a bobsled, it's like being kicked off a cliff in a washing machine. <laughs> That's bobsled. It gets a little bit better. So you're you... saying you're saying it's beating the hell out of you, I think is what you're saying. That is what I'm saying. It is really, really rough. And you feel like you crash all the time because, you're, like I said, you're trusting someone else. You have no sunroof. You have no or no roof, period. No seatbelt. And. You're trusting someone else to not tip you over. So yeah. you're like, did I crash? Did I crash? I don't know. Maybe I crashed. Feels like we crashed. We hit something. Oh, God, maybe we're crashing. That anxiety never goes away. What does help, though, is learning the track that you're on and being able to count those different curves and understand where you are on the track to help you relax in the sled. So you and your partner go through all kinds of, I guess, what is it, memorizing the track? And oh, you did, what do you do, count to three or four? Or she starts to lean and you lean, too, because you know where you're at? The leaning is all a myth. You don't lean. In, in cool runnings, the head is always going like left, right, right left, right. <laughs> That's not a real thing in bobsled. You are jerked one way or the other by G-forces. So there's no coordination of the lean. As the brakeman in the back of the sled, you're trying to go with the feelings that come. So you feel the curve coming and you just kind of relax into it. Because you can get G-forces up to like four Gs sometimes. And you feel that. It's like a roller coaster. Um, so really just relaxing in the sled and going with whichever direction the sled is going. And you say brakeman, you're not braking at all going down the hill, though. No, not braking at all. That would be bad. Right. Do not brake in the middle of the track. <laughs> For all the future Olympians out there. Right, right. When you got down to the bottom and you won the silver, did you feel that? Did you feel like, damn, that was a good one or you have no clue? I have absolutely no idea. So I have a unique story in the sense that I bobsled for six months before I was at the Olympic Games. And so maybe, you know, with, with a little bit more time and expertise, I would have known, oh, that was a good run or not a good run. But I had no idea. Wow. You know, you always see people like you see you jump out and look. You must look right for the time. I'm going straight to the scoreboard to give me the details because, yeah, like I said I have no inkling of what's happened up to that point. Or, you know, sometimes I can tell from my driver, you know, she's giving the sigh that it's not good or she, you know, pumping her fist that it was good. And there's always someone on the side, too, that's helping you, like, manage the sled as you get out, et cetera. So they're kind of throwing up the hands, what place you're in. So there are some other inclinations. But, yeah, in general, I have no idea. All right. This all ties into to financial planning. We've got some people listening going, what does this have to do with finances? And it actually... It has a lot because you wrote a piece about what Olympians can teach you about money. Of course, now you're in the field of money. When did you first get interested in financial planning, Lauren? I'd say definitely interested was 2012, but I've always had a slight interest my whole life. So I was a finance major in college. I got a master's degree in business. I've always been trying to figure out, like, how do I properly manage my own funds? And that's what kind of led me to financial planning for others. Got it. But in this piece, you start off with, much like an Olympian, people want to be an Olympian with their money. You list four different things people need with their money that's the same thing people need to get on the podium in the Olympics. So let's walk through these. What's our first one? Patience. 
We've got to be patient with our finances because you don't just wake up in the morning and become an Olympian. You don't have all the skills you need. You don't have all the abilities you need. It's the same thing with your finances. You've got to have patience. I'll tell you a little story about when I was a pro athlete, I set some money aside and I didn't realize that, you know, when everybody's talking about this idea of compounding interest, that the more you set aside on the front end, the better it is in the long run. And so I had to have the patience. I didn't even realize I was exercising patience at the time, but now you, here I am. You were just ignoring the money. I was completely ignoring it, but I was saving. I was I was doing one thing right, but I was like, I don't really get this whole investment thing, but you guys keep telling me to put money over here, so I'm going to do it. And then with time, I, I started to better understand. And like so for the last couple of years, I haven't been able to put money into my retirement account because I've been starting my business worth winning. But I've been watching my account grow because guess what? I stacked a boatload of cash away on the front end. So patience is now paying off. That's so it's so important. And we've seen the other side of that in the news lately, Lauren, with Bitcoin. You know, I mean, so many people rushing in with Bitcoin and and you got to think these are not people looking at, you know, some of our listeners talk about the long term effects of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is the wave of the future. But that future is a long way off. And a lot of those people know that. But I feel like that last wave of people last month and two months ago, that had nothing to do with patience. That was I want money right now. Zero percent to do with patience, those people, and a lot of them are feeling the effects of it. And it's kind of like playing the lottery when you do Bitcoin in the way that those people in the last month or so have, where you you rush out hoping to get rich quick right. and you probably waste the rest of your paycheck doing so, as opposed to, you know, if you had been putting a little bit of your paycheck aside every time you get some, you know, you'd be in a better position. You wouldn't be worried about getting in and getting rich quick. Is it frustrating for you when you coach people with their money to tell them to be patient? It is hard to explain. It's one of those things that no matter how many different ways you say it, it is a really hard thing for people to grasp and 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 commit to. You know, what is our long term plan? Are we trying to be rich tomorrow? Or are we trying to be rich when we're ready to retire? You told me you wanted to be rich when you retired. So, you know, we've got to be patient then because it's not time to retire. It's funny how much that has to do with coaching in track. I was a track athlete, nowhere near as 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 good as you were. I I barely got a scholarship to go to to college on a track scholarship. But holding the mirror up, you know, a good coach often just holds the mirror up, right, and says, "Here's what you said you wanted. It's a lot of money in retirement, not money, not not money right now." And they can't be the same thing all the time. What's your second one? My second one: consistency. Being consistent. You've got to set so what we were just talking about, setting money aside every time you yeah. get that paycheck. I was thinking how much these tie into each other. Yes, they are all tied into one another. And yeah. it, I mean, that's with being an Olympian. You got to do all these different things. They all tie together. And then you get to the big stage and you win. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're doing is setting aside money Every time we get paid, we're doing whatever it is that we need to do on a consistent basis. We're avoiding this thing that, you know, is, is our habit and our crutch on a consistent basis. You can't just, oh, backslide here, oh, backslide there. And then it adds up to a bunch of backsliding. And then you look back and you say, why didn't I reach my goal? It's because you weren't consistent. You know, you set up a budget and beginning of the year, New Year's resolutions. OK, let's do it. Uh, but you don't get results when you quit the budget. But that's what's funny is that people start off, and I know this probably happens when people hire you, people start off and they're really excited, right? And as you know, that excitement goes away. And as a track athlete, I mean, you've seen this, practice the first few days of the season is awesome and it's a lot of fun. And then it starts to hurt and it's the same crap over and over and it just isn't any fun anymore. It does. It gets so monotonous from day in to day out. You're just kind of like, when am I going to see this add up? And then all of a sudden there's that day where it all starts to come together. And if you've been consistent, if you showed up every day, if you've done all these different workouts, even though there hasn't been a race to motivate you, there hasn't been anything else, you've done all of this, then you say, oh, I, I get it now. I, I blew this workout out of the water. And then you get to a race and you're like, I blew this race out of the water. And, you know, even those races, you multiple races, you don't you don't win every single race initially. You're trying to win the championship. Those races are getting you in in race shape. Same thing with your finances. Yeah, well, it is funny because people, you know, we, we draw out these lines of uh, growth and they're always this steady line. And I know in physiology, it doesn't work that way. You plateau and then you have a big pump and then plateau again, then a big spark. The same thing, I think, with your money. 
I definitely think that's the way that it works. You, you're not going to always have a great day at the track, but showing up at the track every day, being consistent, showing up every day to manage your finances, being consistent is what is going to allow you to, like I said, get to the big championship and win. You know, you've had times, I'm sure, in your career, Lauren, when when it wasn't going your way. And certainly there are people, they fall off the wagon with their budget. They fall off the wagon with with their investing strategy. What do you do in that case? I mean, how do you get your butt back out to the track to keep going? Ah, this brings me to my next point. Perseverance. You've got to be able to persevere through whatever it is that you come up against. So making wise money decisions isn't always super fun and exciting, but to make it to the Olympics and to really succeed, it's not all fun and games either. And so as an example, 2004, I was part of a botched handoff in a relay. Ugh. In 2008, we turned around and did the exact same thing. And so I started to feel like it was personally my fault. There were a lot of different things at play where those botched handoffs were. But we're on the Olympic stage. The world is counting on us. And we could have easily been world record team, not just a, a winning team, but broken a world record. And here we are walking to the finish line. So in 2012, I decided... I'm going to be here. I'm going to do everything I can to help this team have the proper chemistry that they need to succeed. And I wasn't the one that went there, ran in the final, but I did help the team understand, hey, we've got to get here. We've got to perform. And I kept going after two terrible losses. I could have got to the 2012 games and said, forget about it, guys. I messed up the last two. You just have at it. But no, like you got to persevere. I'm now in my third Olympic Games, and this is my opportunity to do it. Well, wow, how, how exciting is that, by the way, to turn that around? It was so amazing to be able to turn that around and to, to, you know, really stick it out and have the confidence to say, I am capable of doing this. I can get this stick around the track. And, you know, I ran the anchor leg in the preliminary round, and that's where we were out the first two times. We never got to the finals because the preliminary round didn't go well. So to bring it home was like this really, really sweet moment where people were like, oh, you're not competing tomorrow, but you're excited about today. And I'm like, yeah, I'm super excited. My team is doing what they need to do. You know, mistakes are not what break you. It's not being willing to deal with the mistake, move forward from that mistake, and really persevere through it. That is the thing that makes money decisions and other decisions catastrophic. It's funny, as you're talking, I think about wins in my life, and I think about when I won the first time, that was pretty sweet. That was awesome. But when I won after I lost was way more sweet, right? Yes. W winning where I hadn't won before and knowing that I'd climb that hill was a huge, huge euphoria. Definitely. When you come off of, you know, being punched in the face twice and then all of a sudden you get to stand up and say, hey, I won. It feels so much better than just win, 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 win all the time. You know, they say it's lonely at the top. So uh, that climb, and I think people start to appreciate later on in life the journey to get to the top and the things they had to go through in order to really appreciate what it is that they've achieved. And I love your last point here. Last but not least, adaptability. You've got to be ready to adapt. You, you can pivot. What did I do? I was a track and field athlete. I started to get fat, just to be frank. <laughs> P-H-A-T -P though, right? Yes, the P-H-A-T. Right. <laughs> you know, I instead pivoted because I wasn't able to compete at track and field on, a, on an elite level anymore. I felt like, okay, well, my career is over. What do I need to move on to? And then I bumped into bobsled. So one, being ready and seeing doors when they open is a lesson for our listeners. But two, realizing that just because it's, you're not great at this anymore doesn't mean you're not great at anything. What were they looking for in bobsled? The heavier you are and the faster you are, the more awesome it is. So I'm like, oh, I'm fast and I'm a little bit chubby. Hey, over <laughs> here, pick me, pick me. <laughs> So being able to adapt to, you know, whatever it is that's changing and being prepared for those unforeseeable circumstances is really a great testament to the best way to be able to organize your finances. Set your emergency fund aside. So when something happens, it doesn't set you off track. You adapt and you move on. For me, that's the most important lesson. The adaptability, the fact that you were in the Winter Olympics is is really a testament to adaptability and something I think all of us can learn from. Speaking of learning from... I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about your awesome new podcast worth listening. We told your story today, but you're you're in the business of this, Lauren. You're telling these inspirational stories for people every week. I just want to be like Joe when I grow up. Right. <laughs> but when do I grow up? That's the question. 
I'm trying to pivot into podcasting. Yeah, so I started Worth Listening to encourage people to start discussing their finances. I think one of the biggest hurdles that we come up against when it comes to managing our finances is feeling ashamed, not wanting to talk about it, not being willing to share what you have going on. So then no one can provide advice to you. If you're talking at least to your friends about your finances, say, hey, do you got a 401k? Well, why are you putting money in that? How does it work exactly? Start having those conversations and then you can put yourself in a position to make better decisions. Of course, we all want you to hire a financial professional, but it really starts with being comfortable talking about your finances with anyone because we're so secretive that the catastrophe of it all comes when you make a mistake because you didn't bother to ask anyone. You didn't bother to open your mouth. So on the podcast, people tell their money memoir. And that's basically them telling their money story because who better to learn from than someone else's own experiences? Uh, So you can say, hey, me too. That happened to me as well. I am not the only one that's suffering with this or has made that mistake. I am not the only one that has blew their emergency fund, even though I, you know, went through the process of finding one. And so it's just making it relatable for everyone to say, hey, let's discuss money. Let's get these money topics open. Let's start having an exchange so that we can be better educated and make good decisions. Well, and I love the people that you talk to, too, doing that, that are having these really frank discussions, people I wouldn't have expected to be so frank about their money. Clinton Portis, Marcus Ginyard, Olympic rower, uh, Megan O'Leary. I mean, you're you're digging into it with some people that I, you know, that don't really need to open up about their money, but they are, which is awesome. Yeah. Athletes are role models. And I felt like it would be really great to have athletes and millennials. And so those, that's who I'm interviewing is athletes and millennials to get that conversation going. But you're right. There's some people that made some really huge mistakes. And, you know, it could be embarrassing to talk about that. But Clinton Portis was nice enough to share that with people so that someone else doesn't end up in the same position. How can we learn if we don't learn from someone else's mistakes? And if no one is willing to talk about their mistakes, then there's no way to learn. The podcast is worth listening. The Your blog is and, and uh, where your practice is located is worthwinning.com, worth-winning.com. We'll link to both of those in our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. Thanks a ton for hanging out with us, Lauren. And uh, I'll be thinking of you tomorrow night as I'm watching all those athletes come out of the tunnel. I'm looking forward to checking it out with the rest of the world. If you're not an Olympic fan, become one as of tomorrow. Cut your TV on and watch the opening ceremonies. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Okay, I got to come clean. When Lauren Williams said she won a silver medal at the Olympics, I knew we had a lot in common. I mean, back in the day, I was the sledding champ on the hill behind the old elementary. You know what I mean? She says it was hard, but it was so easy. I mean, I'd get on the sled and go. Nothing to it. Speaking of stars, back in 1988, the Jamaican bobsled team became famous in the film Cool Runnings, making their debut down a mountain. Of course, many of you know that, but which other star recently depicted in a major motion picture had their big moment in the same Olympics. I'll be back with the answer and my medal to show you in just a moment. Life is full of things to manage. Your work, your family, your plans, and your treatment. Consider Kesimpta, Ofatumumab 20 milligram injection. You can take it yourself from the comfort of home. If you're ready for something different, ask your healthcare provider about Kesimpta and check out the details at kesimpta.com. Brought to you by Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation. Hi, I'm Emilio. I'm a program manager at Google. Right now, lots of people are looking for ways to learn new job skills. That's why we created Google Career Certificates, an online training program for fast growing fields like IT support, project management, data analytics, user experience design, and more. You don't need any prior experience, and you can be job ready in about six months. So put your skills to work. Go to grow.google slash certificates. Hey there, money fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. How about this news? I just looked for my downhill sledding gold medal and only now realized it's some gold foil wrapping paper around an old candle lid. Huh. No wonder Scott Church had such a smile on his face when he put it around my neck back in, uh, uh, well, we'll just forget what year it was. Anyways, let's get on to the year of your trivia question, which was 1988. That was the year the Jamaican bobsled team famously competed as depicted in the movie Cool Runnings. What other star had their exploits in those same games chronicled in a major motion picture? The answer? 
If you said ski jumper Michael Edwards, a.k.a. Eddie the Eagle, you flew to the right answer. And extra points if you knew his name was Michael Edwards. If not, you crash landed down the mountain and will have to rewind this episode to the beginning of the trivia so that when your friends are around, you can at least pretend you knew. Give them your best unimpressed look, too, when they don't answer correctly. But you do. See ya! Big thanks to Lauren Williams for stopping by. How about that, man? How's that for a great way to kick off the Winter Olympics? I think we need, like, the theme music from the Olympics. I know. Do you think she does that, like, when she walks into a room? I've been in rooms with her more than more than once she didn't mom should have got it playing as she was walking down the stairs she didn't do it but yeah that that had the um you know like a, that's a ringtone <laughs> right. oh yeah yeah she tries to play it off oh I, oh sorry guys mm. uh, i gotta take this call and just like really slowly reaching for the phone so she right. can get the whole like right and as she reaches into her bag she accidentally pulls out the metal first and the, yeah. oh that's not my phone oh, geez, i'm sorry, sorry. How'd that get in there? Yes. i usually don't take this one with me i <laughs> well, usually take the other three i can't believe that got in the way hey let's throw out david lifeline and tackle some of life's or rather life insurance's most important questions our friends at haven life insurance agency they've been spearheading innovation within the life insurance industry by focusing on those two things you value most, OG. Olympic golds, baby, <laughs> and spending $100 million. <laughs> What's, what else is there? Uh, unfortunately, the other two things are your family and your time. It's why they created a high-quality and, most importantly, affordable term life insurance policy issued by Mass Mutual. you can purchase entirely online. No need to wait several weeks for a decision when you can get one instantly with Haven Life. Head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now for a free quote and to learn about life insurance the modern way. I like that little spin at the end, the modern way. Like the rest of the ways are so unmodern, aren't they? <laughs> Actually, they are. <laughs> they if, you've t- ever, if you've shopped for life insurance recently, they're not very modern. They totally are. A guy who's totally modern is our new friend, Johnny. Say hi, Johnny. Hi, Joe and OG and Doug, I guess. Quick one for you. I was just hired as an adjunct professor at a community college, and they're offering me a pension. Can you believe it? I had no idea pensions were still offered. My question is around what to do with my previous 401k. They say I can roll it into the pension, and upon turning 55, they're offering me a guaranteed lifetime payout of 4.25%, which is slightly higher than I was even expecting to get once I retire, since I'm accounting for a 7% gain on average and then minus 3% for inflation. I'm 27 years old and have about 10K sitting in my pre-tax account. Is there any reason why I shouldn't roll my 401k into my new pension plan? Thanks for nothing. (laughs) Thanks for the question, Johnny. And uh, roll that baby into his pension, OG? Oh, God, no. (laughs) Not in a million years. Not in a million years would I do that. I love that this is an audio podcast because nobody can see the look we give each other the second he says it. Like just yeah. the bl- <laughs> slow blink, slow blink, <laughs> slow blink. Why doesn't he want to do that though? Let's let's explain I why. I said not. so. Oh, Damn there it. it is. Thanks for the question, Johnny. Come on, do better than that. Do better than that. Okay, bring my A game. Bring your A game. This is the Olympics for God's sakes. There are two different types of retirement plans, right? Defined contribution plans and defined benefit plans. A pension is a defined benefit plan. And what that is, is you are going to get a guaranteed output. Okay. So you're going to put your money in the college or university will match to some capacity. And then uh, they've got a formula that they figure out and they say, okay, at such and such an age with this income, we multiply by this formula and this is how much your paycheck can be. The downside to that is usually a, it's not tied to inflation. So yeah, you might get 40 grand a year when you're 55, but when you're 75 or 85, that's still going to be only 40 grand, right? You're not going to be able to keep up with inflation. It's a big deal. The second, and I think the larger issue is that if you look at most of these pensions across the country, public or private, is that they're not really funded well. And so if you look at the funding status of each pension plan, you go, oh, it's 60% funded or it's 50% funded or it's 30% funded. And what that means is, is that based on the current calculations, they have only 30 cents on the dollar to pay out to the, you know, uh, pending retirees. So that doesn't give me a lot of confidence. And so, so what that could mean, and usually there's ways around this, right? They'll just raise taxes or increase tuition or whatever the case may be to kind of, you know, buoy that up if they needed to. But in, if they don't do that, then what could happen is that they could say, you know what, we got to change your mind. 
Yeah. We gotta have a different we gotta have a different calculation. We said we we're gonna give you four <laughs> percent. Turns out we can give you two and a half. You're no right? longer even partially at the wheel anymore. Not even in the least bit. And uh, I've had clients recently that have said, Hey, I just got this letter from my pension department that says that their pension is under review by the pension board. What does that mean? It's like, oh, well, because they mismanaged it for fifty years and they thought they were gonna grow it at ten percent a year and they really grew it at six and a half. So they only have, you know, 40 cents on the dollar. So you're going to get a pay cut. Oh, they can't do that. I go, yeah, they can. They can. It, it sucks. It really, really sucks, especially when you're 78, you know. So pensions aren't bad. They're a nice thing to count on. I love them. If I could get one, I'd take one. But if I got a choice between putting my own money in the market and investing it my own way and devising my own withdrawal strategy out of it, I'm going to take that over a defined benefit any day. So, And some uh, people get nervous when you say that, OG, but it doesn't have to be difficult. I mean, you could go to any place. I mean, you could go to M1 Finance and they have those pre-done pies based on your, you know, what you need out of your retirement and just yep. let the pro take it. And you can, uh, you know, with this particular account, you know, you got $10,000, put that in an IRA. You can invest it at M1 or any place else for that matter as an IRA. And now you can contribute to that, right? So you can continue to add money to that IRA. You can turn, you know, make a Roth. You can put new money in a Roth. You, you, there's all sorts of different options. You yeah. might also check your employer at the university may also offer a 403B right, for additional contributions. That might be another way to add more money to your savings plan. Thanks for the question, Johnny. Uh, Doug just brought down the mail, OG, and we have a letter here from Christopher. Christopher says, would love to hear more about OG's time in the service. First of all, I'm currently in the old Air Force and have been living in Korea for a couple of years now. Love it over here. How about this? This is the Korea episode. It's across the other pond. Yes. And he says, and he says, love it over here. And not for sure if you guys know about the new blended retirement system for service members. Instead of the 50%, after 20 years of service, it's going to be 40% of base pay, but they'll match up to 5% of your thrift savings plan, which is really nice for 80% of the military members who don't make it to retirement. I'm about to hit nine years, and I'm putting in about 30% of my base pay, which comes out to about 915 bucks a month now. I have about 35000 in my thrift savings, and with the fantastic returns I'm getting in the I, which, by the way, for those of you playing the home game, is short for international. The S, which is short for small company, and C, which is common stock or the large company fund, it's hard not to add more. Currently, members have a year to decide, and all new service members are automatically enrolled after the 1st of January 2018. I plan on reaching retirement and think that the extra 10% of retirement pay sounds better than matching 5%. Just wonder what you two think, even though I haven't learned anything in the last couple months that I started listening to you guys, except what a fiduciary is. I'm slightly interested in your opinion. <laughs> Love listening to the show and tell all my military friends about you. Why these days does every letter start with a request and end with an insult? <laughs> Maybe it's because the answers are, are you know, a cringe. start with well thought out uh, information and end in garbage. I don't know. Here comes the cringeworthy stuff. All right. What do you think there? So this past year, year and a half or so, the military changed their pension calculation, just just as he said here. And for existing service members, you have an option to figure out which one you want to do. Same thing with our caller, Johnny. I like the idea of being in control of that better, right? If you think about the retirement age for most service members, if they get to 20 or 22 or 25, you're still in your low 40s, probably, you know, if you're enlisted. Even if you're an officer, then at 25 years, you're 47-ish maybe. So there's life after the service basically is what I'm saying. So the pension's nice, but you're probably going to go to work anyway, right? So you've got all that time for compounding with your contributions, with the government matching contributions, and then you really don't need to take the money out till you're 70. And so it gives you tons of flexibility to kind of choose your own ending there. You know, if you, if you want to retire early and You've saved enough over that over that career. You can make your own pension out of your TSP funds if you don't want to, and you want to continue to work and add money to it. You know, into a different you know retirement plan, then you could do that too. So you're not forced, basically, is what I'm saying. So I like the stuff where I'm in control a little bit better. So you do like the match? Yeah, yeah. Give me the match versus the. So you're going the opposite way of him. Well, and it it just depends. Like everybody's got their own calculation. Yeah, you know, halfway to retirement. Yeah. 
you know, it might work out better for him to take the 50%. That's you know, what I, I thought. I don't to do the math on it, but, um, yeah, on his, I think it's going to be close. Just my gut says it's going to be close either way. Yeah. Yeah. They probably, that's probably how they figured it out was, you know, if you're younger, take the match. If you're older, I talked to somebody a couple of weeks ago who is, I don't know, maybe 18 years in and they're totally not doing the match. Oh yeah. yeah right. They're like almost Forget done. Them. Good stuff. Uh, thanks for the question. If you've got a question for the show, Head to stackingbenjamins.com, and guess what? You'll see right on the top of the page questions for the show. Click on that, and you'll see all the ways to reach us. Thanks, everybody who's listened. It's been just a fantastic, fantastic kickoff to 2018 so far. We've had a lot of fun guests and a lot of great letters, and it's always fun hanging out here, except for the fact that I got to hang out with you and Doug. Oh, gee, that's the only bad part. So Interesting. Thanks to everybody who's left a review of this year podcast on Apple podcast, Stitcher, wherever you listen. Here's a review on mom's fridge off of Stitcher. Scott says five stars, my favorite show period. I've been a regular listener for three plus years now, and this show remains my favorite. It's more entertaining than, and he left it right there, which, which is the perfect review. I think that I think our reviewer passed out halfway through writing it. <laughs> He just passed out. He's like, this is way. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, how many uh, foamy beverages do you have to have to get through a Stacky Benjamin show? Come on. Coming up on Friday, we've got a- another great roundtable. I'm going to leave this one a surprise. It's going to be a good time, but, um, but I'm not going to tell you who the guest is. Uh, I think you're going to like it, though. If you say so. And finally, if you're looking for good financial help in your corner, OG is taking clients. Head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash letter O, letter G to see his calendar and uh, schedule a time when you can talk to him more about what that would take to get him in your corner. All right. That's going to do it for today. Go stack some Benjamins, everybody. Doug, what should we have learned? Hey, Joe, why don't you and OG get back to debating about what the best flavor is for a snow cone? We both know it's grape. But let's tell everybody what they should have learned today. First, take some advice from Olympic medalist Lauren Williams. Fight through adversity, show up every day, stay consistent with good money habits. Sooner or later, good things will happen. But the big lesson? Don't let Joe's mom show you the video of you, quote, winning the medal in the downhill sledding competition back in eighth grade. Might turn out that maybe some other kids were having a little fun with old Doug at the time. That's okay. Who's winning now, Scott Church? Making fun of me in my moon boots and snow pants, huh? I'm a podcast announcer on top of the world, baby. Let's see what you got. Nothing. Scott, uh, ch- uh, huh. Scott's a nuclear physicist? Huh. Well, good for you, Scott. We're both winning. How about that? Thanks to Lauren Williams for stopping by. Isn't she amazing? You'll find her podcast, Worth Listening, wherever you listen to this show. Speaking of Winter Olympics, big thanks to Emilio Estevez for teaching me everything I know about hockey. I still can't believe he didn't win the Oscar for that Mighty Ducks movie. That was amazing. I laughed, I cried. You're amazing, Emilio. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Kathleen Selmans handles design, newsletter, and classroom opportunities. If you'd like to learn more, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash classes. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjaminsCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm pretty much the guy in charge of everything around here. Trust me, this well-oiled machine didn't get like this all by itself. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor.
you saw a film. Got to use my movie pass, baby. This one uh, stars uh, 50 Cent, who we've been talking about a lot lately, yeah, and uh, Gerard Butler. It's called Den of Thieves. Hey, pay attention. This is yours. Most important thing, keep your finger off the trigger at all times, unless you need to shoot somebody. When that happens. 3170, we're being held up. Hold it until you run dry. Dispatch, we are under heavy fire. Keep your eyes open. Every cop in the country is going to be looking for us. Big Nick, original gangster cop in the flesh. What's your tally? Four dead, six on the way to the hospital. I tell you, he's a bad guy. I'm gonna make you a deal. Give me the names of all the guys who got away. I'll get your medic. Ain't no snitch. Yo. He's done, son. We got a problem. It's major crime. Get to know your enemy, boys. Every big time crew has been busted. These are the guys who took him down. Get yourself, I take you home to the memory lane. This is Gang bangers, these are not. Sounds like the cops are as bad as the bad guys, OG. They're just a little different uh, tactics different type, type of crew. Hey, did you like the movie Heat? I didn't see the movie Heat. God, how did you not see you? I said something to my brother about that, and he's like, uh, Body Heat? I'm like, no, no, that's a different movie. <laughs> body Heat. <laughs> that warm, that, that's that movie that made me all warm. Um <laughs> it's like a double entendre right there it's so bad anyway you know you never saw the movie heat al pacino val kilmer you know it's funny i did but it was man what year was that that was a long time ago came out 95 Mm -hmm. yes i I saw it right after it came out don't remember anything about it bad cops uh yeah it wasn't about bad cops i don't well then i don't remember it (laughs) yeah okay (laughs) so this is kind of like heat 2.0 but it's got a twist on it. And so I was kind of like what I think you're thinking about this movie, which is, oh, my God. I can't believe there's a movie about a bank robbery. Wow. Crazy. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? Oh, and it's got a lot of guns in it and shooting and explosions. Um, it's not as much that as it is just an interesting movie. Because I don't want to give too much away because it doesn't go the way you think it should go. Right? It's not bad guys, good guys, you know, movie over, right? Certainly the shoot 'em up stuff is kind of cool. I like that anyway, but uh, it's interesting. This is definitely a matinee movie to see. You know, if you can get it for five bucks, that's a good price to pay. Uh, if you wait for it to come out on Netflix in a week and a half, that's also a fine time to watch it. It's not a bad movie. I would not have seen it if I didn't have the movie pass, right? Like I wouldn't have just gone, yes. Hey, let's go spend 12 bucks on this. Yeah, movie. Right. Cause, cause, cause me, th- I'm thinking of it like you are like, I'm not going to waste 12 bucks yeah. on this movie. I'll wait for it to come out on Netflix. Yeah. Or, or something. Yeah. I wasn't even going to waste my movie pass on it. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> it's good. I liked it. And I'm, and, and since I kind of went for free, um, well, kind of sorta for a reduced rate. Yeah, except I've gone to like six movies this month. So That's what I'm saying, a reduced rate. I mean, you you went for two bucks. Yeah, exactly. Then I totally was happy to see it. I saw Gerard but Butler. I'm like, that's all I need to see. <laughs> like there, there it is. Gerard Butler in a movie, clearly a hit. He's done some good movies. Yeah, 300 but, was pretty good. Yeah, but 300 was really good. <laughs> 300 was fantastic. Name a second one. <sighs> I kind of liked... Um, that one where he did the stuff. Oh, probably one of my favorite movies of all time. The Bounty Hunter. I'm just kidding. Law Abiding Citizen. I haven't seen that one either. You haven't seen Law Abiding Citizen? Nuh-uh. No. That movie was probably, probably one of my favorite movies. So that is a definite Netflixer. If Yeah. You're not going to not like that movie. I gotta change the I gotta change the topic a little bit here because we're running out of time. But the oh, okay. uh, I, I like the I like Gerard Butler's topic. I never did specifically say thanks to everybody who came out in Seattle. It was funny. I RSVP'd for ten people. We had twenty people, and uh, the server kept coming back to me, going, "How many people are coming?" And I kept saying, "I don't know. Yeah. I have I have no idea." But it was a great time. Thanks everybody who came to hang out with us. 
and uh, love meeting friends of the show. But uh, Frank, who's been a longtime friend of the show, and actually he sponsored our old Green Room podcast when that podcast was a thing. He has started making, with his new company, Check These Out OG, sleeves of survival pucks. And so these are, they look like a little puck, and they're full of these essentials. You can keep it in your car or whatever. It's, it's, it's pretty neat. I think he just started making these. In fact, I didn't even ask him where he makes them, but check this out. So this one, survival puck first aid, and you open it up, and it's a little tiny first aid kit. Inside, nice. Inside of it. And then this one is essentials, and you open it up, and there's a Sw- bullets and MREs, oh. S- Swiss Army knife, a whistle, a light, wicks to burn stuff. Uh, anyway, there's fire, first aid, light, water, medicine. Uh, really, really neat stuff. I gotta ask. Cool. Uh, I gotta ask Frank how how people get these and. Uh, let them know because Frank's been a friend of the show for a long time. So r- really cool stuff. But that was neat. Great seeing everybody. Sorry to hear that uh, Ryan, who stayed late, um, <laughs> Ryan stayed late, said goodbye to him last. And uh, Ryan told me that he got a parking ticket because he stayed so long. That's how fun it was. When you stay long enough to get parking tickets, we had a good time. Actually, it was supposed to be six to eight. And I believe that... Um, that we left about 20 after 10. So I was gonna say, according to the American express bill that you brought home with you, bam, uh, <laughs> everybody cleaned up. Nice work. Yeah. So, uh, New York, unfortunately is off. I just found out the event that I was going to be speaking at is done. We'll hope to get there soon. Philadelphia in June is on. We'll be coming there. I'm going to see if we can do something in the Las Vegas area. I'll tell you what, if you're in the Las Vegas area, let me know. And uh, we'll see if we can do a meetup while we're in Vegas for lunch or dinner while we're there in the middle of March. And then uh, hope to, this time in Orlando, I'm not going to have time, but in the fall, when I'm back in Orlando, we'll uh, we'll do an Orlando meetup. So good stuff. All right, guys. Thanks again. And uh, we'll see you on Friday.